The hush of burning noon had fallen like a spell over the Valley of Roses. The grasshoppers were silent in the long grass, the brown lizards basked motionless on sun-scorched patches of rock, even the bees were asleep, cradled each in the heart of a dreaming flower. Not a leaf stirred in the bronze-green towers of shade that beech and walnut reared, singly or in groups, on the lower slopes, above, on the sheer hillsides, the serried ranks of stone pines had the luster and the rigidity of burnished metalwork. The air, a quiver with heat, seemed curling and bluish, filmy wreaths about the pine stems, as if the trees sent forth visibly their pungent incense, and ever and again warm gusts of that heady aroma swept the valley, overpowering the sweeter breath of its leagues of bloom. From end to end, the levels of the long, narrow glen were incarnadined with the triumph of one flower, Aphrodite's own. Roses and millions, and with scarce a leaf between, sheeted the lawns and brimmed the hollows, and all were of the color that in every tongue is named from their name, celestial rosy red, love's proper hue. From their riotous and tangled growth in that lonely place, it was to be guessed that they were not of man's planting or tendance, yet they were not like any other wild roses, but many petaled, and fragrant beyond all blossoms that art has made sweetest. Here, truly, was the reign of the rose, a sight to make glad the heart of man or God, if there were any to see. It seemed there was no one. There was no trace of human habitation in the valley, nor on the hills that rose steeply around it, their sides dark with forest, their naked peaks glittering against a sapphire heaven. There was no sign of life or movement, and only one sound broke the enchanted stillness of the place. A low, droning sound, that rose and fell rhythmically, not unmelodious, and somehow in keeping with the hour and scene, the sound of tranquil snoring. Someone or something, man or beast, was sleeping away the hot noontide of that midsummer day, hidden among the rose thickets. The sun was sloping westward, and a cool breeze from the heights came whispering among the pine trees and still that sound went on. But now it mingled with other sounds, the voices of men talking excitedly at the lower end of the valley, where two converging rocks, overgrown with mosses and ivy, made a natural archway. There has been a trespasser here, exclaimed one voice. Look how the grass is trodden down yonder, within the gateway. Aye, so tis, answered another. Saw one ever the like of that, now? But it will have been some beast, a stag, maybe, or a wild boar. You are a fool, replied the first voice. Who knows not that never a beast on all the hills dare set foot in the garden of King Midas. They do say, here the voice sank lower, tis because he is a son of the mountain mother, she that rides through our forests all nights, with lions drawing her car. And you that are so wise, retorted the other, can you tell what should take a man in yonder, where it is death to trespass? That is what we must find out, cried the first speaker, so come on, child of a tortoise. The two shepherds, for such they were who now advanced into the valley, had followed but a little way the track of the intruder, when that persistent and musical snoring signaled them to his lair. Pushing aside the tangled rose branches, they looked down on a man lying asleep. An old man, fat and paunchy, but strongly built. He lay sprawling, his bald and massive head, on which a garland of ivy sat askew, pillowed on a small, empty wineskin, his only garment was a tunic of undressed deer hide. At their loud halloo, he awoke and sat up, regarding them with pale and red-rimmed eyes that blinked in the sunshine. There was in his countenance an extraordinary mingling of wisdom, lewdness, and good humor. But the shepherds noticed only that he was exceedingly drunk. They threw themselves upon him and bound him, unresisting, with sprays they tore from the rose bushes, laughing the while at his bewildered air. The old man gave a sudden chuckle, and in a hiccuping voice, Ho, ho, he said. It seems I am your prisoner, my fine fellows. And who may you be? If you are robbers, you waste time on me, a poor old man, with nothing left, not even a drop of wine in his traveling bottle. We be shepherds of King Midas, replied one of his captors, and we shall take you straightway to our Lord, to answer for your trespass on his rose garden. Why, very well said, returned the old man, chuckling again, I will be glad to see your Lord. In my present case, I shall most likely see two of him. What did you say his name was, my friend? His name is Midas, said the shepherd, reverently. All the world knows it and honors it. Mine is not so famous, said the old man, but it will be heard of, it will be heard of. What may it be, asked the shepherd. 
I am called Silenus, said the old man, and his fat sides shook with laughter, so that the shepherds laughed also, without knowing why. And then they marched their prisoner, who lumbered unsteadily along in his flowery bonds, out of the Valley of Roses, and down through the plains to the city where King Midas's palace was. The old man called Silenus said not another word on the road to the city. The shepherds told him cheerfully that the king would assuredly put him to death, for the Valley of Roses was holy ground. They were sorry for him, but so it would be. They thought it most likely he would be flayed alive, however, he might only have his throat cut. Either way, he would not be able, unluckily, to join them in the corrals they meant to have with the handsome reward they expected for catching him. But the old man lurched along at a good round pace, saying nothing, and now and then laughing softly, so that they thought he was still too mazed with drink to understand them. It was late at night when they led him into a great hall, with pillars of rose-pink marble and walls painted in gaudy colors with the scenes of the lion hunt. Clusters of pinewood torches and bronze stands filled the hall with their blaze and resinous odor. Here, on ivory couch, King Midas was taking his pleasure, drinking wine out of a two-handled gold cup and listening to the music of a flute player. Several boon companions of the king reclined on couches near him, drinking from cups of silver. Cupbearers went noiselessly to and fro, behind the royal couch, a guard of spearmen stood stiffly. The great, bright hall was as quiet as the Valley of Roses, save for the melancholy music of the flute player, a slim, dark-eyed boy squatting on a leopard skin in the middle of the floor. The shepherds, kneeling before the king, told their tale with humble eagerness and much pointing to the strange figure they had dragged after them into the presence, the fat, half-naked old man whose arms were bound to his sides with trails of fading roses. He meanwhile stood patient, blinking ullishly in the torchlight as he had blinked in the sunshine, until they had been dismissed, curtly enough, but, to their visible ecstasy, with a silver ingot apiece. Then the king sat up and bent a frowning look on the prisoner, and the impassive bodyguard moved ever so slightly, as though expecting an order. There was a long pause. Unbind his arms, said the king sharply, and when it was done, who and what are you, he asked. A strayed reveler, Midas, just a strayed reveler, answered the old man pleasantly, in his husky voice, and then, peering at the king out of his strange, light eyes, I do not think much of your housekeeping, he exclaimed. Have you never a cup of wine to spare for a wanderer? Cottagers have given me that much, and without waiting to be asked for it either. Well, I must help myself, it seems. With that, he stepped a trifle unsteadily to the couch nearest the king's, took a full wine cup from the hand of its amazed occupant, sat down heavily beside him, and drained the cup at one draft. Cupbearer, Phil, he then said solemnly, holding the cup out at arm's length. While one might count twenty, no one spoke or stirred, guests, guards, and slaves stared thunderstruck at this incredible stranger. Midas suddenly burst out laughing. Fill his cup, he cried, and you, Axius, make room for him beside you. This old toper is in the right, by Sibylle, it must not be said that the king of Phrygia is less hospitable than peasant churls. And he has made me laugh, too, with his impudence. My housekeeping, ha, ha. Lucky for you, friend, whispered the courtier Axius as he made room for the new guests, that our king takes your prank as a jest. You were a dead man else. The old man called Silenus lolled back on the embroidered cushions and took another long draft. I am not so sure of that, he murmured, but there is no doubt about one thing, this is admirable wine. And he again held out his cup to be filled. Next day, nothing was talked of in the city but the extraordinary old man who had bewitched King Midas in his own palace hall. Bewitched was the word used by eyewitnesses, slaves of the royal household who had brought the tale with them to the morning market and few of their listeners could doubt that it was the right word. A little group of elderly townsmen, given to argument and wine-bibbing, professed indeed to see nothing marvelous in the matter. The king, they said, being in a favorable stage of liquor, had taken a whim to admit this tipsy trespasser to his drinking party, instead of killing him, the old fellow's ludicrous aspect and behavior had saved his skin, and this was the only witchcraft he had used. No wonder the king was tickled, who could choose but laugh when the mad wag seized the Lord Axius's cup and nearly sat down on top of him. Well, it was wine had put courage in his heart and mercy in the king's, great were the virtues of the grape, so let them all bless Bacchus for his gift of it, and be moving on to the tavern, now the market was emptying. 
At this point, the conversation of these worthies was interrupted by a grave and dignified person who had been standing near them and in whom they recognized the king's chief butler. You mistake the matter, my masters, said he, pompously. I should rather say, you have not heard the whole of it. Wine is a great power, a very great power, and the gift of a very great God. I was glad to hear you speak so wisely about that, and bless his name, it showed a right way of thinking. I commend you there. But, as I say, you have not been told all, and he shook his head with an air of mystery. They assured him that, like the rest of the townsfolk, they had heard the whole scene at the palace described, from the moment when the two shepherds dragged in their prisoner until, to everyone's stupefaction, he was installed as a guest in the place of honor next the king. Others might see witchcraft in that, but for their part, they saw nothing but a freak of royal humor. But you do not know what happened after that, said the chief butler. One might guess, said one townsman, with a laughing eye, that the worshipful company were carried drunk to bed. But what did happen? He added hastily, seeing the chief butler frown. Why, it is a long story, said the chief butler meditatively, and I am keeping you from the tavern. On this hint, he was pressingly invited by the whole group to accompany them, if indeed his palate could condescend to a vintage only fit for simple citizens, and after no more hesitation than served to give proper value to the favor, he graciously consented. The wine, he was pleased to say after the third cup, was very far from bad, if not, his hosts must excuse him, quite equal to what he was in the habit of drinking. The worthy townsman smiled and exchanged sly glances. The tavern keeper, piqued, muttered under his breath, equal. No, nor would be, unless twere vinegar. For it was pretty well known that, while King Midas owned all the best of the vineyards for which Phrygia was famous, and the wine he drank with his guests was a liquor for the gods, that served up to his household was of the vilest description, the dregs and last pressings of the grape vats nor durst the chief butler himself make free with the royal cellars, so rigorously was he held to account by his master, the fact being that this king's ruling passion was avarice, and whither it brought him we shall presently see. It had already led him to most unkingly trafficking in the produce of his superb vineyards, the thing was done by discreet agents, but everyone knew of it. The very wine on which the chief butler was now bestowing qualified approval had been bought from one of those agents by the tavern keeper, whose reputation for good vintages had arisen from a series of such dealings. Therefore he now muttered a sneer, and the townsmen, regular customers who were in the secret, smiled knowingly at each other. But presently they were all listening, with bated breath, to the chief butler's tale. This old man called Silenus, he began, when he had emptied the fourth cup, had bidden the cupbearer fill twice, or it may be thrice, after settling himself on the couch, when says he to the king, Bid your rabble of slaves go forth of the hall, Midas, for I can never talk freely in the presence of men unfree. And I am in the mood for talking. Besides, they are dead drowsy, send them away, that they may sleep. And the king sent them away, his bodyguard and all. But he said, pointing to me, I suppose my chief butler may stay to fill our cups for us? The old man said, Certainly, I am all for having our cups filled, let him do his office. So I stayed. I can tell you, my friends, I began to feel then that I must be in a dream. This Silenus, the gods only know who he is or where he comes from sitting there with his great paunch and his deerskin, such as the hillmen wear, and speaking to our lord like one king to another. And our lord, who never took his eyes off him from the time he came in, did you hear that, masters? No? Ah, uh, ha, uh, I noticed it, few men more noticing than I, though I say it, well, as I was saying, our lord the king doing his bidding like a child. I and listen like a child to a fairy tale while the old man talked, as he called it, but it was not talking at all, it was singing. What kind of singing? asked one of the townsmen curiously, as the chief butler paused to drink. The strangest I ever heard, he answered. Now it was like the voice of a minstrel singing to his harp, and now like the harp itself, just a sweet, thrumming sound, without words. But there were words most of the time, some kind of long poem, such as wandering minstrels chant at the king's feasts. Only, they sing deeds of kings and heroes, things a plain man can understand, but what this poem was all about was beyond me. Perhaps the king and his boon companions knew. Anyhow, they listened, as I was saying, like children to a fairy tale. It began, I think, about the way the world was made, about a time before time was when there was neither earth, air, fire, nor water, 
but only the seeds of them floating in empty space, and how the seeds got sifted out somehow into their four kinds and became four elements, and land and sea and sky, and all creatures, from worms to men, were all formed out of these elements. A likely tale! As if everyone did not know that earth and sky are gods that have been from everlasting, and that Prometheus made the first man out of red clay. This Silenus with his seeds and his elements, forsooth. Can any of you tell a plain man like myself what he meant by them? His listeners assured him truthfully that they could not. On the contrary, it now appeared to them that Silenus must be a madman, which would explain a good deal. But not everything, said the chief butler, nodding sapiently. For instance, though his song seems the various jargon now I try to recollect it, I must own that, while it lasted, it seemed most wonderful and delightful. There was a great deal more of it, which I cannot recollect at all. It went on and on for hours, and I thought I could have listened to it forever. It seemed to be letting me into some great, happy secret that was the only thing worth knowing and would make a new man of me. Not a slave anymore, a king, a king. The chief butler spoke the last words in a wistful tone, very unlike his usual pompous utterance, and remained silent for some minutes, staring dreamily in front of him. He started, as the tavern keeper, at a sign from one of his hosts, quietly refilled his cup. Well, as I was saying, he resumed in his usual voice, this song the old man kept on singing had not a word of sense in it from beginning to end. But I do not think he is a madman. A madman could not have done what he did with the king, I tell you, our lord was like so much wax in his hands. Besides, the man was too easy, too merry, yet not riotously so. The way he carried his drink witness to a sound mind in a sound body. My friends, among his other singularities Silenus may boast himself the most powerful drinker that ever was known in Phrygia. For you must know I did my office all the while he was crooning that song of his, though I replenished the cups like one in a dream, and the mere truth is, when morning dawned, the king and his friends lay in a dead slumber on their couches. But as the first rays of sunrise darted into the hall, now dark, for the torches had burnt down to their sockets, Silenus got to his feet and went out, more steadily than he came in. And so it was I that saw the last of him. Is he gone, then? exclaimed one of the listeners. We heard nothing of that. I dare say not, said the chief butler. You have heard the gossip of underlings, who ever mar a curious tale in the telling, as the saying goes. I, Silenus is gone, and what is more, the king is gone after him. He paused to enjoy the effect of this upon his audience, then added, Our lord's first demand on waking was, what had become of Silenus? We searched the palace in vain and trembled for our skins. But the king neither fell into a rage nor ordered a hue and cry after him, he will have gone back to the Valley of Roses, he said, in marvelous good humor, and if my luck holds I shall find him there. And he commanded his hunting train to be got ready on the instant for a chase among the hills. Yes, our lord has gone a-hunting, with nets and spears and great retinue, after his manner, but this time neither wild boar nor deer nor mountain lion is his quarry. No, worthy friends, there is some glamour cast upon him, and his chase is after that tipsy, bloated, enchanting old vagabond called Silenus.